gotta tell you the truth. When it comes to bullshit, big time, majorly bullshit, you have to stand in awe. In awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. No contest. No contest. Religion. Religion easily has the greatest bullshit story ever told. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day. And the invisible man has a special list of ten things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these ten things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. Always needs money. He's all powerful, all perfect, all knowing, and all wise. Somehow, just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. This is the Sophics, broadly speaking. A symbolic movement through three ages, while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars would attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Aries the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Aries, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull, in the same symbology. Now, Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Aries, the age of Pisces or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we've all seen the Jesus fish on the backs of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22, 10 when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover will be, Jesus replied, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing a pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the sun, God's son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, a main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28 20, where Jesus says I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age. Which is true, 
as Jesus' solar physical personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus, being a literary and astrological hybrid, is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago, on the walls of the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth, announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph the Holy Ghost impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' Miracle Conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. And the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of a great flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide, and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased I have not stolen became thou shalt not steal, I have not killed became thou shalt not kill, I have not told lies became thou shalt not bear false witness and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Government, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, the great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many many more, are all attributes of Egyptian ideas, long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders wrote, when we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died, and rose again, and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin hid a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world.
fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astro-theological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament there's the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. For historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Tacitus are the first first and only refer to Christ as all the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the anointed one. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles a claim to him would have made it into the historical record. He didn't, because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man whom they call Christ in place of the sun and pay him the same adoration which was originally paid to the sun. In fact, the words holy and Bible translates directly to the definition of sun book. The word holy is but a mock solemn utterance of the ancient Phoenician word, heli, from whence formed the Greek word, heli or helios, that is the sun. The Middle English word Bible, via, Old French from Ecclesiastical Latin, Biblia, from Greek Biblia, books. From Biblian book, originally a diminutive of Biblos meaning papyrus scroll, of Semitic origin. Hence, Heli Biblos, equals Helios Biblia, equals Holy Bible, equals Sun Book. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story, developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect, and like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historicize the Jesus figure for social control. In 325 AD, in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established and thus began a long history of religious bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for over the next 1,000 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other related theologies, is an historical fraud. These religions now serve to detach the species from the natural world and likewise each other. They support blind submission to authority. They reduce human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, and in turn awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And most critically, it empowers the political establishments, who 
have been using the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is the most powerful device ever created, and serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish.